Y'all ready? Let's thank the Lord. Let's do that tonight. Father, you are good, beyond good, beyond words, beyond anything that we could share tonight. Our vocabulary is not enough. Our mind can only grab a glimpse. You've given us these things that are pictures, but yet we see through the fog of all we've ever seen because of sin, but Lord, a glimpse of the foretaste divine, of that which you have for us. We know love, but not like we're going to know there. We know goodness, and we know peace, and we know joy, but not like we're going to know there. We know friendships and fellowship and relationship, but Lord, you're going to take it to a whole nother level. We've got smiles on our face that represent the, the, the completeness of our heart, but Lord, to, uh, to see you, to be in the radiance of your glory, to know that good for, forevermore, faith becomes sight. To know that we belong because of you, Jesus. Father, down here on this earth, there are times that we, we don't speak of your glory. We don't walk in worship. We don't bask in your glory, but we should. And from t- we, we say that we want to, but we're distracted and taken away. But there, there will be nothing that stands in the way. And Lord, we can express the ultimate of our heart all the time. So Lord, we thank you for that. We bless you for that. And Lord, I just, uh, tonight as we look to your word, I wish I had Dr. Lee's vocabulary. I wish that I could uh, take a glimpse. And Lord, I, like Broad has said, I want to get closer. Um. Uh, Your word says that we're supposed to draw near to you. You will draw near to us. May that be our ambition each and every day, to be close and to fulfill your will. So, Lord, may the words of my mouth, the meditations of my heart be your words and your thoughts, your meditations, your wishes. We thank you for the word of God that speaks truth to us. May we not add to it. May we not take away from it. And Holy Spirit, may you join us in this place to bring us from where we are. Open up our mind, even as you did John on the Isle of Patmos, to let us just get a glimpse of glory divine. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Take your Bible. Revelation 21. And if um, I leave part of it out tonight, do not fear. Unless God changes my heart, I'm going to be taking Genesis 21, the new beginning, and I am going to preach on heaven Sunday morning. So you'll get a double barrel. Amen? Just uh, sometimes you just want to plow a little deeper. Let not your heart be troubled. Anybody got troubled hearts walking through this world? Anybody wore down by sin? Not just yours, but those that you love, this thing in our world. Let not your heart be troubled. If you believe in God, believe also in me. He knew he was the way to God. And there were those that were listening that had chased after God their whole life, but Jesus was the key. In my Father's house, King James says, are many mansions. Some of the translations say rooms. The more I study this, the more I understand that that's probably a little bit of a better view. When I was a kid growing up, There was a song that we sang. We don't sing it anymore, and I'm grateful that we don't. Just give me a cabin on the edge of glory. Y'all ever sang that song? I don't want a cabin 
and God's glory. They're, they're trying to say that a house would not matter. A cabin would just do, just let me be in the fantastic place of God's glory. Well, it's not that I'm being poor mouthed about it and I don't want a cabin, but I, as we look at things today, I don't want a mansion as the way that this world would look at it. As a matter of fact, if you could take the greatest, most extravagant home on earth, it would be beyond lower than any slum district that heaven could ever have. Why would we want to take something that's temporal, that has no reflection of the beauty of God, except through this veil of sin, why would we think that that would be the glory of heaven? But yet, we take the mentality of earth, which is to accumulate uh, success is seen as money, success is seen as possessions, success is seen as having. So down here we dream of having the best, having the most, having the most beautiful, having the most recognized, but that is nothing. All that is in heaven that is beautiful and glorious and real, it will be, will be expressed by nothing other than Christ. The full expression of God. So when he says, in my Father's house are many mansions or rooms, if it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare what? Heaven is a place. Heaven is not just, uh, and, and by the way, I never, ever, ever would have thought that this would have been debated. I never in my life would have ever thought that people would say, well, heaven's just a figment of your imagination. It's just a goal that you are looking to achieve. But that actual nonsense is it's growing in our world today as people uh, are, are buying in to Satan's rhetoric. You could always go to someone and say, ask them the question, do you want to go to heaven one day? And the answer would always be yes. Now they want to argue with about it. But if you ask them, would you rather go to heaven than hell? Everyone would say yes. Amen? Except some idiot who thinks that uh, you know, they're, they're, they're a contrarian and they just want to go their own way and do their own thing. And you're going to find some of those people every now and again. But... but you would, I would not wish hell on my worst enemy, right? I wouldn't want anybody to go there. But we would always want that which is good and right and best for anybody. We should think that, right? I go to prepare a place. It is a real place. But when he says, I go to prepare a place for you, understand that the only word that I know I can really think of is home. And you're right, Ed. I, 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 I've heard people say, well, I, I'm going to get a, I'll have a, a, my name on the mailbox in front of some place. My name will be me, right? And, and, and you don't, nobody will have to stick out their hand and introduce themselves to me. And I won't have to, I won't, hey, I'm Brian Stevens. We will know as we are known. My name will be me. But I will belong there. And I will have belonging there. When the prodigal son, after being stupid and wanting his inheritance ahead of time, and there's so many of us who want our heavenly inheritance down here, we want the best of earth and the best of heaven in the same lifetime. But he wanted and didn't get. Because he was a sinner, and sinners doing what sinners do, they waste and, and squander and end up empty and longing for something that's real and best. But when he came to that point in time, he said, I will arise and do what? Go to my father's house. I will arise and go to my father's house. 
when I close my eyes to this world, I will arise and go to my Father's house. Absent from the body, present with the Lord. When that prodigal son returned home, the Father was looking for him. Looking for him. Praise God for a God when we go and make that journey will be looking for us and will run to us and embrace us. That prodigal, because of his sin, had, it, had been rehearsing his apologies. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Just let me be like one of the hired servants. But the father would have nothing to do with it. And that father said, bring the best. Slaves have no sandals for their feet. Put shoes on his feet. Put a ring on his hand. Take the best and kill it. Because we're going to have a party. My son who was lost is home. If that's not a picture of heaven, what is? You know the story of the prodigal son. The truth of the story is the older brother who thought that he deserved all that. Right? He didn't have really a relationship with his father. He did what he thought was good, right, and best, but how terrible that would be. A broken relationship. When, when the father was so close, so close, are you listening to me? So close, but yet an eternity separating the two. In my father's house are many rooms or mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there you may be, what's the word? Say it again. That's right. Always. Forever and ever. Never to meet. When speaking of the rapture, it says that we will meet the Lord in the air and so shall we ever be with the Lord. The glory of it all. Now, when we get to Revelation 21, John looks and sees a new heaven and a new earth. Now, I don't know what your translation says, but if it's translated correctly, that heaven is singular, not new heavens. Some will look at that and put an S there as if we talk about the, you know, the, 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 the three heavens that, that Paul talked about. The first heaven is when we would think of as the sky where the, the, the birds fly and, and the clouds are and, and where uh, Delta flies. Amen? They call that the first heaven. If you go beyond that, we've seen those, those rocket ships that would take off and go up, and then they would pass into what we would call the second heaven. They would go beyond the, the barrier of earth uh, out into space, we would call it. Outer space where the galaxies are. And all those galaxies, those trillions of galaxies, that is the second heaven. And then the third heaven is moving into the place of the abode of God, into the place uh, where, where God is, where his presence is. And, and, and Satan, though he was there one time, one-third of those angels who were there at that time were cast out from that place. That's called the third heaven. Paul said, in the body or out of the body, I do not know, but he was taken to that third heaven. Here we see John on the Isle of Patmos where he was persecuted, where he was taken to Patmos to, to be exiled away from. But isn't it funny, the world says, we'll take you away. God says, I'll bring you in. 
And he has this vision and he, he is looking into future tense. That's impossible unless you're with the eternal God who has no tense. The Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. So he looks through time as if it were possible. He's looking into eternity and he sees something that what, what we at in this parentheses of, of time, what we would say is something in the future. But he sees it as if it were happening. And he said, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. The word new there, creation, brand new. Pastor, why is that important? It's not refurbished. I, I bought a drill one time, and, and I thought I was getting a brand new drill. And I looked on it, and it was refurbished. That means they found one that broke, and it wasn't any good anymore. So then they sent it back and did a little work on it and made it look good again and, and put it out and sold it like it was new again. That's not what God's going to do. He will put a new heaven and he'll put a new earth. Why, pastor, why? Because there will be nothing that has a breath or a semblance of sin in it. But there was sin in the new heaven, in the old heaven, the one that's existing now. Amen? Satan sinned there, right? One third of the angels sinned there. And there's plenty of sin down here on this earth. And Brother Broadus said it well. He said, uh, I think we're going to get to a place that's beyond all the, the, thing, the thoughts of sin. There will be no semblance at all. There will not be a vapor of it. There will not be a nanosecond of it. It will, not, it will be as if sin never existed. A new heaven pure and clean. And a new earth as well people want to describe that new earth and they want to try to expand it out and all that kind of stuff listen when we look at scripture which is truth my the truth is not my explanation of scripture the truth is scripture and when this scripture when it tells you what it, it when it defines itself when it explains itself you got it but when it doesn't don't you add to it there are times that scripture is intentionally vague it tells us the earth we know this is the earth so we understand that it's something like this but it's not going to be like this Let's go forward and you'll understand what I'm trying to say. I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Past tense, they're gone. There was no more sea. This new earth will have no sea. Now, people say, well, is that all water? Well, that's what I call sea. But it, it, in Scripture, seas are also seen as boundaries or barriers. So whether there is no more H2O or whether there is no more barriers, I'm just going to take it as it is. Now, if you said there's no barriers, obviously we would understand that people from this earth since Genesis 5, since the Tower of Babel, we have been different. We have been separated. We have different tongues. We have different nationalities. We have different races. But there will be no different races in heaven. All the nations will be one, just born again children of God. So when we look at that, it says when we get to heaven, in this new heaven, new earth, there will be only purity, only the goodness of God, only love, only joy, all of those things, there will be nothing that separates us out, all right? No barriers whatsoever uh, if if it is simply talking about no C as an of the h2o we would look at it and say well at that point in time god would say that there's no need all right verse two and i then i john saw the holy city new jerusalem new jerusalem coming down out of heaven from god prepared as a bride adorned for her husband it's completed when Jesus says, I go to prepare a place for you, 
It's what the Lord's doing. He's preparing a place for us. But here we see the completed work. He says, prepared. It is finished. It is done. Prepared. And it, it, it says, as a bride adorned for her husband. Uh, I'm doing a, a wedding in December. And uh, Lynn and I met with the Monday. And uh, this young lady, she's from El Salvador. And, and this may be hard for you to comprehend. She's only seen one wedding in all of her life. And it was one of those, all the family was there, and five minutes later they were married and boom, done, whatsoever. And, and when she was describing the, the wedding that she wants, she, the first word she said was elegant. And I'm like, I'm cool with that. But I brought in my ringer, Lynn, right? Because, uh, you know, me describing a wedding, I can tell you all, the, the nuts and bolts of it, Bradley. I can tell you what we're going to do and all that kind of stuff, you know. But, but, but to, to, to talk about elegant, I needed to get Lynn involved. And we started talking to them about all the things that we had in our wedding. And, oh, they were getting, he was getting nervous because there were six groomsmen and six bridemaids. And I said, I had six groomsmen and six bridemaids. Whatever Lynn wanted, Lynn got. And they're getting married at 2 o'clock. And, and I said, well, we got married at 2 o'clock too. And, and, and I remember standing like this, and my dad was there, my dad performed the ceremony. So there was going to ever be any divorce because my dad performed the wedding ceremony. And, and my, my brother was my best man behind me. And I remember turning, my, my groomsmen came by and they opened up their coats and they had, a, they had something for me to see, you know. So they're all getting in their place, but they had to make sure that I laughed and all that. But I remember turning and looking and at 10 minutes, about 12 minutes after two, seeing my bride for the first time in that dress. And it just, y'all know what I mean? It just, uh, it was, uh, Rick, it was one of them holy hubba hubba moments. It was just one of those things that I said, I've never seen anything as beautiful in all my life. I love the phraseology that John in describing something that was more beautiful than anything he had ever seen in all of his life, said, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Look what it says in verse number nine. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bows filled with the last seven, or the seven last plagues came to me and talked with me saying, come, I will show you the bride, the lamb's wife. The bride. Who is the bride of Christ? Yes, the believers. And here he is saying, I will show you the bride. Those that, that are so beautifully put together to come to be presented to the groom. Jesus Christ, the, the groom. Here he sees the picture of this beautiful thing coming down to be with him. There's so much I could say about this, but if I did, it's going to take so long. I just want you to get the, the gist of this. You are the beauty. You are the most beautiful to Christ. I don't know that we understand that. I think we would try to, what I would do is I'd say, oh, no, no, not, not me, oh, yeah. You know, Jim and Doris, now that's beautiful. No, not me, you know. But listen, we are the crown jewel. <laughs> he looks at us, Rick, and says, holy hubba hubba. This is what he had in mind before Genesis 1-1. Forevermore. Forevermore. A God with no beginning was looking for a relationship with people who said yes. With people who loved him. And as much as Christ chased us, listen, we chase after him. When he makes that presentation of us, asking you shall receive, seeking you shall find, knocking the door shall be opened, he is saying, come unto me, all you that are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Come to me, ask, 
Knock, I'll open the door. Seek me, I'll be there. Draw near to me and I will draw near to you. He's looking for a loving relationship. This is why worship should absolutely explode from us. There should never be dull worship in God's church. Dull worship comes from a lack of appreciation of who God is and what he's done for us. That's what will be different then. Because here in, in, in Revelation 21, we are seeing John as if he's on the outside observing what's happening. But the truth of the matter is, we're there, we're coming, we're being presented. Verse 10, he carried me away in the spirit to a great and a high mountain and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. Look at that first part of verse 11. You know, the, the, the numbers on the verses were added for our benefit, but, but that's the ending of the last sentence. So let me read it to you again. Showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. The glory of God. Having the glory of God. Not observing the glory of God. Having the glory of God. Not looking upon, not talking about. But this is the gift that has been given. Having the express, expression of the fullness of God in us. I'm not God. I'll never be God. I'm not saying like some false religions that, that we will arise and we will all be little gods. I'm not saying that. That's blasphemy. But I will have his glory. The radiance of his expression. Back up with me to the Old Testament. When there was the man named Moses who went to the Old Testament expression of the place of God called the tabernacle, the abode of God's presence, the pillar of uh, fire by night, the cloud by day. And, and when, the, they would, when it stopped, they stopped, and they would put the tabernacle up, and the, the cloud would come down and rest in that place. The presence of God would be there. And Moses would go into that tabernacle and meet God face to face. And when he would leave that tabernacle, the Shekinah glory of God would be on him because he had been in the presence of God and he was different. He carried with him, even in this temporal, fading, sinful world, he still carried with them the, 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 the remnant of the glory. But then we will have it pure and complete. When they saw the Lord risen. <laughs> when the disciples were in that room, and I don't know what they were talking about, but Jesus didn't even use the door because he is the door. He just stepped in. He didn't have a badge that said, Son of God, but he had the glory of God. I think of the time they were fishing, <laughs> and he's on the shore. Try it over there. You think they'd learn. But when they caught the fish and they couldn't even get them in the boat, and John said, 
It's the Lord. And Peter, right? And he didn't care what anybody else saw. He didn't care what anybody else thought. He just pulls off everything and jumps in the water because the only thing that mattered to him at that moment was getting into the presence of a holy God. And we have to twist people's arms to come to church. We got to bribe them. We got to talk them into it. We got to make sure that everything's just the way that they like it so that they'll come to church. Because if, we, if the temperature's wrong or if the preacher's too loud or if the preacher's too long, or, uh, then, then, well, it just wasn't a good service today. Right? Don't you? Yeah, come on. Y'all know what I'm talking about. You know exactly what I'm talking about. I promise you one thing. When you see the real thing, when you see the real thing, none of that other stuff, all that will just fade away. To be in the presence of God. I actually had someone tell me one time, they said, preacher, we'll be bored when we get to heaven. Because they have to be there so long. We'll be bored. Somebody one time said to me, they said, preacher, there'll have to be baseball in heaven. We'll have to have something to do. <laughs> Come on. Come on. There won't be any baseball in heaven because nobody will be thrown out. I came up with that in the last two seconds. Write that down, Lynn. I don't, I don't want to forget that one. I, my time is gone. Let me, let me at least finish verse number 11. Having the glory of God. <laughs> Her light was like a most precious stone like a jasper stone clear as crystal folks like a diamond like a diamond you ever seen a diamond polished up i mean they clean it and they polish it and you put it in the light and what happens Whew. but yet that's looking at something, obviously we know, formed over time with flaws in it. But when we see that, that was put together in time, in time, but yet it has none of the flaws of time clear as crystal the glory of all right that's the lord calling carla um here is a something you're going to start to see a pattern of that if you can read chapters 21 and 22 in the coming week Here's the pattern that you're going to start to see. Think of a scale between 1 and 10. 1 being low, 10 being high. In that scale, you're seeing degrees, right? Degrees going from bad to good, from good to great, from great to excellent, from excellent to flawless. There is nothing in heaven that's of any degree. Everything that you see in heaven is pure. I almost said pure gold, but it's more than that. It's, it's the representation of God. So when we look at heaven, we always look, like at when we started tonight, and we talked about all of the things, no death, right? No sorrow, no pain. We're, we're, we're gauging it on that scale of this is where we are, and it will be better than. But I'm here to tell you, it is better, but it, it, there is no scale. It is all perfect. I don't know how to say it any I don't have the words to describe that which is beyond perfect. So in any aspect of anything you're thinking of, there will be no flaw. There will be, no, there will be nothing that takes away. It will be absolutely perfect. Sparkling, diamond, clear, no flaws. 
So don't think about, well, will we remember all the tragedies? No. 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 No flaws. The only thing I can try to say to you, to you is this. When a person gets saved, we say that they're what? Born again. Now they're still in this veil down here. But that is what, that's the best way I know how to say it, is we're going to be born again into the glory of God. To a new dimension, to a new life, to a new understanding, to a new world. To a, when, when we say peace today, we say the lack of of, of that which disturbs. When we think of the, the ocean waters and all of the things, and, but when it's tranquil, there's peace. It's so much more than that. It's not just the absence of, it's the full glory of that perfection. I don't know that you've ever really pushed towards the splendor of perfection, but that's what God has waiting for us. Lance, if you'll go turn off the stream, let me pray a prayer, and if you get a question, I'll answer it for you. Let's pray. Father, until then, uh, we need to be about your business. Until then, we need to have your heart. Until then, we need to seek to do that which is honoring and, and obedience and that which is praiseworthy to you. Father, forgive us where we try to make life about us, when we should be looking only at the glory of God. Father, change us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.